It may sound strange to say that color has three dimensions, but it is easily proved by the fact that each of them can be measured separately. Albert H. Munsell, painter, teacher, and inventor of the Munsell color system. This is The Artful Painter, art lessons for artists, collectors, and people who love art. I'm on a journey to learn how to paint, and you are invited to join me on that journey. The goal for The Artful Painter is to share the what, why, when, how, and where, and who of painting. Your art lessons today come from artist Scott Galatly. Now, he's from Portland, Oregon. It's a beautiful area, and of course, that's reflected in much of his landscape paintings. He does landscape paintings outdoors as well as inside his studio. And in the process, he really works to push colors beyond the traditional palette. The result is uh, our paintings that are luminous, atmospheric, and dimensional. Scott calls his paintings low relief sculptures in pigment and color. He actively pushes the parameters of the colors he works with on his palette. He pushes colors in unexpected and surprising ways that make his artwork distinctive. When he's not painting, Scott has perhaps one of the coolest day jobs that an artist can have. He is a product manager for Gamlin Artist Colors. There he has the privilege of traveling around the country teaching artists about colors and painting materials. And that's how I first met him, was by attending one of these lectures. As a product manager, Scott also works on developing new products for artists at Gamlin. His intimate knowledge of pigments, colors, mediums, and substrates coalesce into a celebration of paint, a celebration he generously invites us all to share in. My name is Carl Olson, and this is The Artful Painter. So, Scott... There's a there's a show that came on years ago. It was called Connections. I think it was done by a guy named James Burke. And I always liked that show because it showed all these, <laughs> what you would think, random connections all coming together and converging in one spot. And that's the way it seems I come in contact with people a lot of times. I first heard of you and first met you back in 2016 at the Olmsted Plein Air event here in Atlanta. And uh, the way I... C- heard about you is actually I was trying to learn about uh, oil painting, getting more information about that. And I stumbled across an artist by the name of Brian Rutenberg. And it just so happened the video that I watched, he was talking about uh, these paints made by gambling artist colors. And that led me to <laughs> to uh, to you. And I saw that you had a, uh, a lecture that you gave at the uh, Olmstead event. So my wife and I attended that and it was just fantastic. So we, so ever since then, I've, I've really appreciated having the opportunity to, to learn from you. And I've, uh, I, I love the, the paintings that you do. I remember you, you had this little painting that you passed out as an example and it was so, uh, I don't know how to, to describe it. It's, you know, it's obvious you're painting on a 2D surface here. But uh, your paintings have this surprising depth to them. It's like you're looking at a 3D hologram almost. Oh, geez. Um, There is a lot there. First, it's a great that's a great story with the connection between um, uh, Brian to uh, to Gamblin and and our connection at uh, the Olmstead event a couple of years back. And then more recently, this last year. um, Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Um, one, I think you touched on a couple interesting things there. One um, is that the more that I've um, dug deep into the materiality of painting, um, the the pigments, the oils, the mediums that we work with, um, I, I don't consider painting a two-dimensional art form. I think it's... Um, kind of low relief sculpture in, um, in pigment and oil. And, you know, there's that aspect of what you see in a painting in front of you 
whether you're 10 feet away or, um, you know, 10 inches away or one inch away that really um, kind of grabs the viewer and brings you into uh, the painting. And that's all about the materiality of, of painting. And um, it's the, the way that light interacts differently with transparent colors and opaque colors. Um, it's the different quality of um, surface, uh, whether it's you know a, a matte surface that's diffusing the light or a glossy surface that is really um, a- allowing the depth and the luminosity of those oil paint layers to really um, you know tell the visual story. Um, so I think it's getting to know the um, different capabilities of oil paint and what it can do. And, you know, not thinking about the oil paint just as a vehicle to, um, create an image, but, um, uh, of the image itself. And that when you look at the painting, you are focusing directly with the paint. Um, it's one of the reasons why I choose to paint on a smooth panel um, instead of fabric most often is to allow the, the viewer to just interact with the paint. And so, you know, I am always kind of pursuing um, different um, trying to let my imagery evolve, letting my color palette evolve. But I think the one constant is that um, I want my paintings to be kind of a celebration of the paint itself. Oh, wow. And it, it, it certainly comes across like that. It's, um, it's It has a very atmospheric look. It's uh, When you're up close to it, it there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of abstraction to it. And yet when you step back, there's you, you get this sense of place. But it just it just has this atmospheric uh, sense or cinematic feel to it. And I almost envision like um, I'm listening to Brian Eno or Roger Eno or Harold, Harold Budd, that type of music, <laughs> ambient music. Yeah. As I'm right, looking at these paintings. Right. Oh, that's that's a great, great analogy. Um, and, you know, it's a lot of my work is done in plain air. And um, one of the, the things that I've. Um, constantly kind of struggled with, and it's a good, healthy struggle with landscape painting. And I've spoken at length with, um, you know, with Robert Gamblin about this, who's also a just fabulous landscape painter is how much do you balance the general and the specific in terms of the landscape that you're conveying? Um, if, if I wanted to go paint, um, a really kind of iconic scene um, such as the Grand Canyon or Haystack Rock on the Oregon coast or the Eiffel Tower that is very specific um, approach to landscape painting. Um, And yes, I've painted at those places before and I've I've done that. Um, But then if it goes on the far other side of the spectrum where it's kind of a generic landscape where it isn't as informed of a specific place, um, then I think something is lost there as well. So at the same time where I'm trying to balance um, realism and abstraction, I'm also trying to balance the specific and the general, um, that yes, these, my paintings are primarily about my interactions with the landscape of the Pacific Northwest. I'm based in Portland, Oregon. Um, but it is also, I don't want the success of the paintings to rely on the viewer's connection to the Pacific Northwest. I do, I am looking for a broader um, kind of appeal to composition, to color, um, to to the paint handling, um, those more abstract qualities. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a balance that I think I'm, you know, constantly um, thinking about. And um, again, it's a good struggle that I have. 
it's interesting that you talk about, um, you know, having a, a specific location, uh, painting that. It's almost as if you have an obligation to, you may, a person may feel an obligation to render it so that it is, it continues to be recognizable. I like, I, I more like the idea of something that has a bit of ambiguity to it. It could be someplace in the Northwest or could be someplace in Colorado or someplace in Georgia. But there's enough ambiguity there that I can put myself in that scene. Right, right, right. I've had, you know, I've had shows where um, somebody have come up to me and said, oh, I know this scene. It's it's right kind of down the road and I went there as a kid or what they had their own story to it and they were totally wrong where I painted it but I felt like it's not my place yeah you can't tell them to (laughs) correct them yeah you know it's like well the important thing is is that you had a connection to the painting and whether it was based on um you know you had and that connection was based on your history and there's kind of a a shared history there with the painting that was created with um, that of the viewer and you know it's not my place to um, to correct that so um, you know let people have their experiences with the painting yes well you mentioned that you worked both outdoors and indoors how does how does your outdoor painting inform this the work that you do in the studio that's that's a good that's a great question and I think every landscape painter has their own relationship to what they do outside versus what they do in the studio um, I love plein air painting I love the responsiveness to plein air painting um, to me, it is both a means to the end, but also an end to itself in the sense that um, if I go out and make a, a, a plein air painting that's, you know, eight by 10 inches, 12 by 12 inches, um, and that painting is successful, then I feel like I've kind of completed the experience. And um, I don't have the need to make a bigger version of it just because that painting is eight by 10 or 12 by 12, something fairly small size. Um, I find that if I'm in a place that is very inspiring to me and I'm working on some plein air paintings from that space and I come away with a painting that is less than successful, which, um, does happen quite often. Um, I feel like that is actually the best fodder for studio pieces because I feel like there's that outside experience that is left unresolved and I really need to um, dive in and explore that a bit um, a bit further. And paintings that are, you know, have some information in it that are done out in the field, but maybe the color scheme is, um, not really where I wanted it to be, or there's issues compositionally in the painting. Well, that just gives me more, um, more focus and more, um, intention to, um, explore those things in the, in the studio on a larger, larger painting. Um, I've also in, in kind of a current body of work, um, try to take visual cues from multiple plein air paintings to inform a larger um, studio piece. And that is a lot of fun because I can kind of take compositional cues from maybe one painting, a color scheme from another, uh, the brush handling or paint quality from yet another painting. And um, I, I try to let my studio paintings take on a life of their own. Um, and I'm not really interested in just doing larger versions of plein air paintings because then to me that becomes about enlargement and just reproduction. Um, and I would rather the plein air painting to live on its own and maybe it can inform studio pieces, but it's not a, 
um, you know, just exercising, scaling up. So you have these, uh, uh, I don't want to call them snapshots, but you have these various pieces or images that you've captured. And so they become a synthesis or an algorithm of, uh, that, that form the basis of a new larger work. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully I can have the opportunity to show them all together. And many times I've done that where, um, the viewer can kind of see, oh, okay, I see where Scott went from the small plein air study. And there's elements of that that's brought into the larger piece. And they, the, so the paintings really start having this great dialogue with each other rather than, um, a direct relationship. Oh, he did that larger studio piece and it's, here's this version over here. Um, it's a little bit more ambiguous than that. Yeah. Uh, when I listen to you, my, my brain just bounces all over the place. <laughs> you mentioned a number of things that are <laughs> interesting to me. W- one of the things you mentioned there was this, uh, this unity between your work. That's something I observed early on in looking at your uh, online gallery and, and seeing your work firsthand is uh, there does appear to be uh, each one stands on its own, but there is a unity. It's fun to see them together because <laughs> they 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 yeah. feel like they belong yeah. to a unified uh, a body of work, and I just think that's uh, that's fascinating how you achieve that. Well, some of it might be um, curatorial in the sense that um, I I do like the to kind of pick and choose which of the work goes onto a website or into a show. Um, I've always found it analogous to kind of bring back the music analogy again. Um, you know, there, there are some really great Beatles songs that never made albums and the albums that were put together is because not necessarily they were the strongest songs at any given time, but they told a story from beginning, middle to end, or they just um, worked as a group together. And that's what made cohesiveness. Um, I kind of feel the same way about putting together an exhibition or, um, you know, putting work on the website is that you do kind of curate what goes on there. Um, I think that's, that's one important aspect of it. The other is that, there are those areas of painters um, careers that you have an intention. You really want to pursue um, a certain subject matter or or a certain um, uh, color palette at one time. Um, But then there's those other aspects of being a painter that you just cannot escape from. Um, There's of ourselves that you can't escape from our kind of like handwriting so to speak. (laughs) And that also creates kind of a unifying force in our paintings, whether we like it or not. Um, And I think that's one of the the reasons why artists um, are always drawn to other artists work. Um, No matter how successful a painter becomes, um, how much facility I think painters always look towards other painters with kind of a sense of awe. And I think what they're, what is the underlying aspect of that is that you're in awe of those aspects of other painters that they themselves can't escape from their own personal handwriting, um, their own uniqueness, their own voice as an artist. Yeah, it makes it hard to to be the way we observe art is different than, say, my wife observes art. And that's not to criticize how my wife looks at art. She looks at it from from a very different standpoint than I than I do. Uh, I was talking to Matt Smith a while back about this. You know, I'm the guy in the the museum that they're about to throw out (laughs) because I'm looking at the, at the, uh, the, the brush strokes and. So, yeah, I'm definitely influenced or uh, inspired uh, by that. But can I write like Scott Galatly? No. <laughs> My handwriting is right. very different. And no matter what I try to do, it's, it's, it's set in it's, – well, I'm not, it's not set in stone, but it evolves. Like if you go back and look at how you wrote as a second grader or third grader, fourth grader, it's very different than how you write 
as, as an adult. So her painting process, it appears to, to evolve uh, similarly. It, it does. It does. Um, we all do have our influences as well. And I think that when you finally develop that kind of voice of your artist as an artist, it's not only for intention, it's your handwriting, but it's also your influences and they're all on display in your work. And, um, you know, I, I think the, the more you kind of embrace that balance of what's informing your work, probably the, the better off, better off you are. Yeah. Well, one of the, th you know, I've observed in your work is there, there has been a, an evolution uh, the, the earliest paintings that I see are very atmospheric. Um, and yet, uh, the, the, some of the paintings, uh, you just, you sent me earlier, some of your, uh, works that are in progress and they're just, they're fabulous. Are they the same okay. as what you did before? No, but they're, they're, they, they seem to build upon this, uh, idea of, as you mentioned earlier, you know, the sculpting of the paint, the paint is sculpture. Uh, and yet you have a unique uh, a color sensibility in your paintings as well. I, I'm just I'm fascinated about your color sense because it doesn't look like anyone else does. <laughs> yeah, there's it, I, the best way I can explain this, Scott, is uh, I, I have a filmmaking background. So I think in terms uh, I make a lot of analogies with film and photography. But sure. Yeah. Sure. You, you, you know, a film uh, when I. Just recently, I finished doing this documentary, and so one of the last things I do is go back and and create this, um, uh, for lack of a better word, a color sheen, a, a look that unifies the entire body of work. So you know, you push yeah. the skin tones, which is in the orange, and then then of course you then you're uh, going to the opposite side of that, the complementary there. You're, you're going to the blue. And so a lot of your block, blockbuster films and, and television shows, they, they'll have that orange teal look. Most people probably don't even yeah. notice it, but you as an artist, you probably notice that. And that's, it's almost like you have your own uh, color lookup table <laughs> or palette for these paintings. They have a very unique cinematic look to it. And I want to know more about your process. How do you, how do you achieve that cinematic look in your, in your Oh, work? gosh. Yeah. Um, I think first off, um, the work that I, I sent you recently, and that was part of, let's see, I'm just counting them up here as I would glance around my studio, maybe, uh, about a dozen pieces that are all very recent. And this is anywhere from small plein air works to medium sized plein air works to large studio work that have all been done basically since early August till now. So in a relatively time of just over two months. So I think just the creating a, a pretty good amount of work within a limited amount of time has added to a certain cohesiveness to the work. In terms of the color, I think one of the things that I'm really responding to right now is that a lot of this work was done at kind of an intersection of of seasons, summer heading into fall uh, here in the Northwest. We've had a very kind of wet spring followed by a very dry, dry summer. And what I've been responding to just visually, whether I'm out in the field painting, whether I'm driving to work, whether I'm walking around the neighborhood, is just the absolute kind of lushness of the area around me. And in these bodies of painting, I, I want to really kind of celebrate just how much there is going on visually in the landscape and that lushness. And, you know, creating some sort of visual control out of that uh, that chaos that is the landscape. Um, and I've also really wanted to push color in a way that wasn't necessarily um, comfortable, that was maybe a little visually jarring to the viewer and even to myself painting them. Um, 
And some of this is more on display on some of the, the, the studio pieces, but dealing with like bright greens against um, your know, bright kind of yellow, warm greens against really bright oranges um, and then really pushing the deeper values down into some of the blues and purples. And well, to my eyes, it's definitely not, it's, it's definitely not like ultramarine <laughs> blue and lizard and crimson and, and cad yellow light on the palette. It's much more than that. It is. It is. And I think that's the other piece of it is just um, really pushing the, um, the parameters of the palette that I'm working with. Um, and this is kind of how that relates back to, you know, to work and uh, gambling. Um, I think we are living at, you know, the, the artist's greatest access to color than any other time in history. We have more choices to us now than painters have ever had in terms of colors to put on our palette. And this is, I think, equal parts inspiring, but also somewhat intimidating. Uh, what do we do with all of these choices? Um, and, you know, I personally am kind of an advocate for artists that look to all of these choices that we have to make informed decisions to make a palette that is totally supportive of what we want to do artistically. And if that means that it's a collection of earth colors, great. If it's a standard kind of impressionist palette um, that most painting students kind of learn in college and continue to use. That's great. Um, I'm really kind of interested in balancing all kind of aspects of, of color, you know, whether it's from, you know, the, the opacity and the strength of cadmium yellows and oranges to the, the depth and transparency of a lizard and the ultramarine incorporating uh, some phthalo greens, dioxazine purples, some of the modern organics that have incredibly high tinting strength. As we talked about that kind of personal voice through imagery, um, handwriting or mark making, you know, one more way that we develop a personal voice as artists is um, in our color choices and in our palettes and having a palette of colors there that totally supports the color voice that we're trying to achieve in our work is, is really important to those ends. You know, we shouldn't have to struggle with a palette that doesn't meet our own artistic needs. And there's just too many choices out there for that. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting thought. I had never really thought of it like that as, you know, as part of defining your voice is really your, the choices that you make in color and your color palette. Yeah. Yeah. And there's some, <clears throat> Um, contemporary, you know, uh, plain air landscape painters that I think do a really great job of just absolutely developing this unique color voice. Lori Putnam, Jill Carver, Amy Erickson um, are three painters that come to mind who, who, who do this really well. I mean, they're, they're, great at capturing imagery, uh, brush work. But I think what really speaks to me out of this, this, these three um, painters work is just this fabulous color voice that they all share. That's so unique um, to, to each of them. Can we talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts then? Because this has got me fascinated. Uh, your, your, you know, we, we started off talking about your color choices. So, um, can we talk about that? What What is in your toolbox yeah. uh, when it comes to uh, some of the palettes that you're exploring, and and why have you chosen uh, those particular colors to be on your palette? Oh, good question. Um, so, right now. Um, 
I'll, I'll share with you what my kind of core palette is. And then um, I'll share with you kind of the changes that I make or some of the other colors that I, I put on there. Um, my core palette is essentially uh, cadmium lemon, mineral color, very opaque, um, a, a cool or we call it greenish yellow, um, gambling Indian yellow, which is um, a really unique uh, transparent, warm or orangish yellow with this really fabulous yellow undertone to it. Um, it's really one of the few truly transparent yellows. And then cadmium orange, great middle opaque orange, alizarin permanent, which is our um, light fast version of um, traditional alizarin crimson. Um, ultramarine blue, so um, having a reddish or more violet blue. And then um, traditionally I've been using manganese blue hue, which is a, a greenish blue, also transparent, um, although more recently I've been working with a, a pigment that we're looking to introduce into the gambling line that's called cobalt turquoise, which is um, oh, wow. opaque, green, blue. It's a little deeper in value, but it makes just some absolutely fabulous warm greens with the cadmium lemon. Um, it's just a really interesting color that's um, really versatile when you either push it to the to the green side or um, creating some interesting middle blues, mixing it with the ultramarine. Um, so I'm having fun pursuing that color as well. Um, other colors that I um, add to that palette for certain paintings would be, um, you know, phthalo green when I want maybe just a really nice punch in the, um, uh, in the green hue family, uh, dioxazine purple, which by the way, the dioxazine and the phthalo make a fabulous blue when mixed together. So those are a couple kind of pigments that make guest appearances on my palette, um, depending on what the needs are of the painting. Um, but that core palette is basically my, um, my kind of take on what's um, often called a split primary palette where you have two colors for every um, primary color, two yellows, two reds, two blues. The only difference is I would take that traditional um, warm red, like a cadmium yellow light, and I shift it to the cadmium orange. Um, that's essentially where I want, where around the color wheel I want, you know, a really nice bright um, high chroma color. Um, the, the palette also, um, is from opaque colors with the cadmiums to transparent colors and that sense of depth that you alluded to earlier right. really kind of comes of dimensionality out. there. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It really kind of comes out of, you know, allowing light to be trapped in those transparent colors versus light that's being reflected off the painting by those opaque colors. And thinking about, um, you know, transparent darks and opaque lights as a general kind of structure to build the painting around. And that really increases the, the value range of the painting, but also the sense of depth um, because of how light is interacting differently with those, those paint colors. So it shows uh, you know, how important it is for us as uh, as artists, beginning artists like myself, to experiment with that palette, to learn the characteristics of the paint, uh, so that you can know you can paint with intention, as you mentioned, uh, to know what type of effect that you want to achieve with with the painting. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's like any you know filmmakers, carpenters, uh, cooks, you know, really knowing their tools. Yes. And that is, um, that's not limiting to our creative, you know, creativity. That is 
that is, you know, I, I'm constantly surprised how I can continue to push the confines of this particular palette. Um, you know, that's, that's liberating, you know, to, to understand all of this. And uh, the other, the other point that I kind of wanted to, to share in this regards is that I, I keep coming back to this, um, experience I had teaching a workshop years ago. It was a plein air workshop up in Washington state where I had the participants work from the landscape using a very classical palette of uh, mostly earth colors, yellow ochre, sienna's umbers. They used the tinting of a black, um, like ivory black for their blue, you know, because ivory black usually tints on the cooler side, especially compared um, to um, when you place it next to the warmer earth colors. And so we worked from that palette. We worked with a standard kind of impressionist palette, uh, cadmium, the lizard, and ultramarine, viridian, and then a purely modern organic palette of um, Hansa's, quinacridones, thalos that are incredibly um, bright. Um, and high chroma in their tints and their mixtures. And the experience of watching these painters work with these palettes was really interesting because the classical palette did not take them as far as they wanted to go based on the colors they were seeing out in the field. And there was inherent kind of struggle with that, but they used the confines of that palette to really accentuate value differences in the landscape and um, to make a, you know, convincing paintings using that palette. The Impressionist palette essentially took them exactly where they wanted to go in the landscape, you know, because that Impressionist palette is very good at uh, capturing the effects of natural light and colors in the natural world. Then their struggle with the modern organic palette was to take their paintings as far as the colors would allow them. That it really led to a more um, inventive use of responding to color out in the landscape and to really allow for more kind of creative or what I kind of referred to as an inventive approach to color in their paintings. And there is, they struggled with that. And um, to me, as a painter, I and this recent body of work is kind of about responding to the land, responding to the lushness of the landscape, but also an exercise in pushing the palette as far as it will take me as a painter. Yeah. I'm looking at this one large painting that you have on, on an easel in your, I guess uh, this is your studio and there's the the, the purples and the pinks and the bright yellows and orange. It's just, um, the, the colors really pop on this. Yeah. Yeah. That's something that I'm, I've been working on for the last several weeks now. And, um, I, because of my work schedule and busyness with um, my family, I'm usually out here in the studio about 5.30 every morning. Oh, um, yeah. For an hour, hour and a half. Try to get in, in here in the evenings as well. And that one has been um, really fun to see this painting evolve and um, really trying to push that color scheme in a way that is like you said, vibrant, but also perhaps a little kind of drawing visually. And I, I, I kind of welcome that as well. They're certainly not the same colors that you find in nature, but they're inspired by it. I think that's just the yeah. beauty of art yeah. is, you know, the early artists, a lot of times they were rendering that because there was no photography. And then as photography started to come along, artists began to, to be liberated and say, I just want to have fun with this, you know, and, 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 and show uh, my feelings about, about the subject or, or even create a subject from nothing. Uh, so we have that luxury here in the 21st century, it seems to create just about anything that our minds, we put our minds to, if we're willing to, to yeah. work at that. 
Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think personally, um, photography was the best thing that ever happened to painting. It really um, changed the role of painting in our culture and artists were able to take it someplace different. Yeah. And, you know, we're still, we're still doing that. Exactly. Well, uh, where could, where could I find out more about, uh, uh, these, uh, different, uh, approaches to color? What, what are some good resources that you're aware of that, uh, you, you, you could share with our audience? I think I'd start with some of the conversations just around color, color choices, pigment characteristics on the Gamblin website or the whole ex- section of the website that we've created called Experience Color. And that's at uh, gamblincolors.com. Correct. Correct. And kind of the, the idea behind that section of the website is that, you know, color isn't something that we just look at. It's not something like Pantone swatches or swatches in a commercial paint store where there's one correct answer for it. Um, the, as painters, we know the personalities of these pigments and these colors that we work with. And just like different personalities of people, they interact differently with, with each other. Yeah. And um, it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships. That's right. Yeah. And um, that's an area of the website that we really wanted to explore is just how uh, different groups of colors interact with, with each other um, and celebrating these differences of, you know, of groupings of colors, whether it's mineral and modern, whether it's exploring um, colors like our radiance, our Portland grays, differences among whites, uh, difference among blacks, celebrating a single color like ultramarine blue. So we, we really kind of dedicated this section of the website to really um, celebrate color and interactions of color. I think understanding the Munsell system, uh, Albert Munsell's organization of color is really important. That kind of three-dimensional model that he created of value, of hue, of chroma. Different painters who've studied um, Munsell take different approaches to it and how it informs their work. I've spoken to some painters who take a very systematic approach to building their color palette around the Munsell system. Um, I find that it's just a really great model to have in your head to think about where colors live on the color wheel. I guess a wheel is a good analogy because, because you have a, uh, an axis, right? So that would be value if I'm, if I've got this Correct. correctly. So you would start at the, the vertical bottom. axis. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. at the bottom is your darkest dark and top is your lightest light. Correct. And then, then you have the spokes coming out. That would be your chroma. And then the yeah, heat. so uh, yeah, right, right, right. Keep going. Okay, <laughs> well, let's see if I can stretch this really bad analogy one step further. Make sure I've got it. So now I got a bicycle hanging up in my basement here. I haven't ridden in years, but <laughs> when, right, when I look at right. that bicycle tire, it, it it mocks me every time. But. I'm, I'm using it for good purpose right now. So the tire itself, <laughs> the tire itself, the rim would be the hue, the, the, the color name. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely right. Um, the other analogy that I like to share to students um, is, is like an orange. Oh, I like this. Where already. you've yeah. got, the, the, the core of that, um, and I'm talking about the fruit here, not yeah. the hue family, right, right. Um, is the, the core of that orange or where those wedges come together is changes in value, you know, from your darkest dark to the mid-tone of gray to your lightest light on top. And then if that orange had six wedges to it, each of those wedges are, is a separate hue family yellow, orange, red, violet, blue, and green. And then if that orange was very lumpy, 
and the distance from that kind of neutral core to the outer kind of skin, the kind of spokes of the wheel, so to speak, that is changes in chroma. But why that orange is kind of lumpy in nature is that if you think about your brightest red, for example, your brightest red exists at a higher value than your brightest blue that exists at a lower value. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. Which is why it's kind of oblong or or lumpy in shape rather than um, a a perfect sphere or a cylinder. So um, I I, I like that analogy. And I think I actually got that analogy from a a Munsell book that I, uh, um, <laughs> I like that. from my so, college years. Yeah. So we're going to stop calling it the color wheel and call it the lumpy orange model. The lumpy Scott. orange of color. Yes. yes. Like that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, let's back up a little bit and talk about your approach to painting. Okay. Um, I'd, yeah. I'd like to know, starting from the foundation, uh, what type of substrates do you like to um to paint on and why oh um i really like i think my favorite substrate is um amber sand um they make a hardboard um that i will um seal and apply um gambling oil painting grounds to I think that's my probably my favorite substrate. Um, if I'm just doing so are you plain air one, it's it's already gessoed or just a plain board. It's just it's just the it's the, the plain board, board that okay. I that I prepare myself um, with the ground. Um, that's probably my favorite. And if um, my my best highly organized um, version of myself, I would prepare a lot of those and have them in the studio for plein air painting. Um, but oftentimes, you know, life takes over and I yeah. just need to grab, um, well, humans you know, are messy. pre-prepared. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, pre-prepared panels and, um, Amber Sands gesso board is kind of my, my go-to, um, for that. It's a great surface. Um, like I said, it's a, a subtle, tooth to it but it's really quite smooth so you kind of interact visually with the paint rather than the paint kind of in visual composite competition with the fabric underneath so those are my favorite for plein air paintings when i get into larger studio pieces it's usually um a, a cradled birch plywood um that i'll prepare you know with the with the alcohol Alcid based oil painting ground um, gives a nice bright white surface without a lot of um, absorbency. The painting really kind of sits on the ground rather than the absorbency pulling the oil out of the paint layers, which can lead to sinking in. So it's not as absorbent as as, as traditional gesso, is what you're saying? Correct. Trad- tr- traditional gesso being, you know, what is Acrylic gesso is commonly referred well, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. 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 I'm, it's 20, much more I'm a 21st than century than guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yep. The terminology changes so, over time. Yeah. It does. It does. So, um, yeah, generally um, smooth panels primed with um, an alkyd base ground is what I paint on. Do you enjoy that process of, uh, of uh, just preparing the ground? Uh, preparing the substrate before you begin a painting or is it a chore? I do. I do. No, I, I really do enjoy it. It's, um, I like that painting is a balance of, uh, craftsmanship and creativity. And I enjoy all aspects of the process. I liked, uh, you, you may have seen this video, but Brian Rutenberg, where he says he likes to touch before he begins a painting, he likes to touch the surface and feels, he feels the, uh, the whole surface there to get a sense of what the canvas is like. He paints on uh, canvas, but, uh, yeah, but I, I thought that, yeah. there's, that we have these rituals that help prepare our minds for the work ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's, 
we all have different rituals and I like that just connection to the materials before we actually start the process like Brian does. Even when I'm not painting, I have a deep connection to the materials through my work. And I feel like I've, you know, I get to know these colors in so many different aspects that, you know, whether I'm painting, actively painting, or I'm at work working with these colors, you know, I feel like it's a very seamless transition from, say, you know, my working life to my painting life. Right. When you begin the painting, you've got the the ground ready, uh, the the substrate ready to to paint on. What's your process for saying uh, or deciding what it is you want to paint and how do you begin to lay it in? I try to take my visual cues from multiple sources, whether this is a section of a plein air painting um, or a cropping of a plein air painting to you know, multiple paintings that kind of inform one composition. What I'd like to start off with is the the overall movement of the painting. Um, Not really where the compositional elements or the, the subject matter elements are placed, but where do I want the main movement of the painting to happen? And different movements uh, within a painting can evoke different kind of visual responses. Paintings that have a strong horizontal kind of movement through it are more relaxing. Paintings with a more vertical movement are more formal. You think of a, you know, like a portrait, more formal. Areas with a strong diagonal tend to convey a lot of um, action. One of the things I've been exploring in this recent body of work is more curvilinear or circular movements throughout the painting, um, which to me evoke more of a kind of a playful composition or a playful movement throughout the painting. So that's ultimately what I start with when I make a painting is what what is the overall movement within that painting? And the that movement when the painting is completed might be informed by subject matter. Um, maybe it's aspects of linear perspective that is supporting that movement. Other times it's just the movement of, of light without painting. I kind of work these areas of high chroma highlights that inform uh, the movement in the painting. So, that's essentially what I'm thinking about when I start the painting. It isn't so much where a tree is going to be located or the horizon line is going to be located, but what's the overall movement going to be within the painting? Uh, this, uh, this is probably a dumb question, but I'm, I'm picturing you in the studio and you're before this, this uh, 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 board and you're getting ready to suggest. Are you Are you laying down... Uh, you know, uh, strokes uh, to suggest where that movement's going to be. I'm trying to visualize how you, how are you mapping this yeah, out on the, yeah. on your, on your board? Yeah. Yeah. Oftentimes I will, you know, just mix up some kind of neutral color. The color of this doesn't ultimately really matter at this, at this phase. Um, but I'll just, make a neutral color, um, you know, thin it down with a pretty fluid medium so I can get a lot of, um, you know, fluidity and um, move and distance out of each brush mark. A fairly small brush, actually, because these are essentially lines. And I'm, I'm basically making broad marks throughout the painting. So I want the, the main areas of movement to happen. And the, I think the challenge is, is from these initial um, marks on the painting to the buildup of color and um, paint surface and opacity transparency is, is the ability to maintain that movement as the painting develops. Beautiful. There's a couple of things I'd, I'd like to, I'm curious about, uh, Scott. Um, 
one of the things um, I, I do as an artist is I've I've been painting my own stuff, and now I'm getting to the point where I want to perhaps you know own paintings of other artists. Is this something that you do? Do you collect art from other painters? Yeah, I do. Um, I would like to more than I actually do, but um, I think it's a great opportunity to study, you know, the handwriting, the color choices of other artists is to actually live with their work. And, um, I can't say that I have a large collection, but I have a small collection of, um, other artists work and it's mostly artists that, that I know either personally or, you know, through, uh, social media, email, whatnot, whose work I've collected. But I, I love as a viewer of art, the element of surprise. And I love seeing work, whether it's at a museum or in my living room, seeing other artists work who I I might see how they handle the shadow underneath a tree or um, the light coming over a hillside. And that reaction that I have of like, well, I would have never thought to have handled it that way. Yes. And that's that element of, of surprise that, that I, I'm constantly fascinated with as a viewer and someone who appreciates a painting. The people that have kind of created their own reaction to reality through the use of color, of mark making, and getting to see other artists work on a daily basis and living with them is a fabulous way of, of, of studying and seeing how they handle specific things in their own unique way. Yes. You know, one, one of the things about you too, Scott, that, uh, I, you know, I'm, I met you first in a teaching setting. You were, you were doing a lecture and demonstration and you really seem yeah. to have a, a great yeah. joy in doing that. What draw, what draws you to teaching? I've always liked, I think the, the great teachers that I had growing up and, and through college, they're by stature, but they were there because they loved information sharing. And unfortunately, not all, not everyone who's in a teaching position loves information sharing. But to me, those are the, those are the great teachers who just wonderfully love to share information to others. And I find that in teaching situations, the more I, the more I share, the more I verbalize, the more I learn and the more I appreciate about my own kind of creative process. You know, painting is a very uh, solitary act. True whether we're in the studio or whether we are, you know, plain air painting with friends, the actual mixing of paint, the actual laying down the, um, the, the mastery of the, the tactile process of painting, it happens by touch and it happens by feel and very, very seldom is there a you know verbal narrative that goes with that. So I find that the um, what's helpful about teaching is that it forces that that narrative out of you in a way that you can share it with other with other painters. And to me, I, I think that teaching has, has connected me to painting in a way that is really unique. And whether it's lecturing on behalf of Gamblin or teaching a painting workshop, being in a situation where you, you verbalize things that are nonverbal through the process of painting is exciting to me. Also what's 
And I think this also relates to some of the, the, the color principles that we talked about earlier. Um, the differences between groups of pigments. And these are things that I think painters get to know through the experience of painting. But then when you're in a situation where, where I can actually create some, share the theory behind that, then it just deepened our appreciation of, of what we do as painters and what we're working with. And to me, that's, that, um, that was really helpful for me in my own history and my own background in painting. And so I, I just really pleased that I have the opportunity to share that aspect with other painters. Well, I'm very grateful for you uh, taking the time to share a lot of what you know here today on this show. And with, it's, it benefits me personally, and I'm sure it benefits everyone that's listening to it. The tagline to this show I, I'm using right now is art lessons for artists. <laughs> and uh, I, I, yeah, so I, and everyone that's been on has been so gracious in sharing. So I really appreciate that, Scott. Where can people find out more about you? What's the best place for them to go and find out about the artist, Scott Galatly? First, I think my, my website, scottgalatly.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well, just with, under Scott Galatly. Those are probably the, the most updated, most frequently updated sites where I show my work. I try to keep my blog somewhat fit, but that is um, a struggle to make that fit. But I think the website and Instagram are probably the two best places. Very nice. So, Scott, I, I really appreciate you being on the uh, Artful Painter uh, podcast today. Carl, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor. I'm grateful to Scott Galatly for taking time out of his busy schedule to talk to us here on The Artful Painter. Wouldn't you agree that that was a delightful art lesson? Fantastic information about color and its approach to painting. Uh, I'm just... There's a lot there to uh, study and, and put into practice here. Be sure to check out his website at scottgalatly.com. You'll see many images in his gallery there of his paintings. Just, just beautiful, beautiful works there. Also check out the many fine learning resources on color itself at gamblingcolors.com. And you can find both of those links in the show notes for this episode at theartfulpainter.com. In a future episode, I'll have Scott back on the show again to talk more specifically about the paints and mediums and materials that are manufactured by Gamblin Artist Colors. Now, when you visit The Artful Painter, uh, I do have a favor to ask. If you'll just take the time to register to receive email updates and alerts, uh, you'll get the latest information on future episodes of this podcast. Thank you for listening to The Artful Painter. It's your turn now. Go out there and paint something amazing.